I'm delighted that you're both here. Um, my name is Liza, and I am the national educator for Prom Room. I have been working with Prom Room for about three and a half years, almost four. And before that, I was on the retail side of things, working in co-ops and managing little health food stores and doing things like that. So, um, outside of that, I you know I teach yoga and I do Reiki and I do all kinds of things. So I, I really love the natural product industry and approaching it from as many angles as possible is really, I think, the best way to go. That's how I feel about health too, right? Um, so essential oils are just a beautiful, beautiful aspect of phytotherapy. When you think about phytotherapy, it's plant therapy. Um, it's another branch of the tree from herbalism, homeopathy, all of these different approaches using plant, even a diet rich in fruit and vegetables, right? That's a way of using plants for your health. Um, so aromatherapy isn't just a smell pretty, it is an established aspect of phytotherapy. And so um, it's really nice when a store like Pilgrims understands that and has a really well established section of essential oils uh, to back that up. Prano, I'm going to tell you about our company a little bit because it leads right into the whole topic for tonight. We're talking about sustainability. And what does that mean in terms of aromatherapy? What does that mean in terms of the world in general? Um, we were founded in 1991 in Belgium by a pharmacist who was very curious about, you know, when making medicine, they were taking extracts of plants, um, isolating them and using them to make medicine. And he, he was curious as to why would we just approach the plant and use whole plant medicine, uh, which you can think of essential oils in that way. Of course, it's not the leaves or the twigs or the petals of the plant, but it is the entirety of the essential oil that the plant makes. And in that moment, it was 1991, he knew he wanted to have a close relationship with growers and farmers um, for many reasons, but one, because he knew he wanted them to be organic. Uh, that was his main focus in terms of um, quality and uh, consistency, um, in terms of you know, how, how the plants can help us. Um, but the other thing is about sustainability, right? When you cut the middleman out, there are brokers who will offer essential oils to companies. He wanted more of a direct chain because he wanted to know what was happening with the oil from start to finish. Um, and so between that and the organics, we now, 30 years later, have wonderful relationships with farmers, growers, distillers all over the world. Uh, we have the ability to um, you can call the office anytime you want, give us the lot number on the bottle of essential oil that you bought, and we can tell you where it was grown, we can tell you when it was harvested, when it came to our stores in Minneapolis, or our warehouse in Minneapolis, to be blended in the bottle and so forth. So you really have this transparency that most companies don't offer, which is great. Um, it's nice to know, you can even find out like, okay, we, when it was grown, but where was it grown, who grew it? Um, I think that's special because that really brings you closer to the whole process. And when you're closer to the process, it's easier to understand why things like organics and sustainability are important. Um, so our organic certification comes in two forms. One is USDA, which is very familiar to most of us. It's primarily on the farming practices, whereas EcoCert is the second. They focus on the, on the plant from really seed or soil, all the way to finished product. There are so many things that we don't always think about as consumer. I mean, I'm a consumer too, even though I'm an educator. Things we don't think about in terms of packaging or product uh, that can have an effect or benefit the planet more than maybe how it otherwise would be. Our packaging is made from eucalyptus paperboard. So we're not using hardwood. Uh, it's a sustainable product because the eucalyptus grows so quickly in many parts of the world it's invasive and so people are wanting to clear cut it anyway. Um, but there's also the aspect of being able to use the stock of the tree, which we're not necessarily using for the essential oil, we're using the leaves. Um, so it's, it, it all comes together in that way. But EcoCert tests things like the ink we use on the cartons. 
um, certain inks can't be composted or can't be recycled. And these can be either. You could throw this in your compost pile, you could put this in a recycling bin, uh, and that's because we're using the right inks and so forth. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> yeah, they're also establishing that we're using, you know, amber glass. When using glass, you always want to use amber glass because it protects the package or the material from sun and light, or heat and light a little bit. Um, where we're not using glass, we are using still recyclable materials or, um, or and plastics that are not leaching. So there is a chemical um, experience for the product, um, which would negate a lot of the therapeutic value of the product. Um, so that's the organics. And I would say when it comes to aromatherapy, the majority of this country is familiar with English aromatherapy, which is an, it's a method of aromatherapy that's really focusing on the smell of the oil rather than anything else, which is great because, of course, smelling nice is good. Um, but they're also using different applications. It's usually through massage, which, again, is lovely. Um, an aromatherapy massage is one of the best things um, in the world. However, there's another model of aromatherapy, one of many, but it's French medical or scientific aromatherapy, and that's what we're founded on. Um, you know, Dominique Badu came from pharmacy land, if you will, um, and his job really was focusing on constituents, right? Isolating chemicals or chemical constituents within a product. Um, and that ends up being what the therapeutic value of an oil is. When you think about lavender, for example, we all know lavender is good for relaxing, for calming. Um, those qualities are based pretty much on the fact that there's a high level of linalool and linalool acetate. So you want to make sure, right, that each batch has, has, has that going for it. So French medical aromatherapy is testing every batch of essential oil making sure that they always fall within the range that we would like it to fall in, to make sure that it's going to do for you what it has always done. If it doesn't fall in that range, we don't use it for that purpose. We might um, sell it to someone else if they're doing you know, English aromatherapy where they're not testing for constituents necessarily, but still with a nice smelling oil. So you have this ability to understand, it's like the ingredients of an essential and with the right ingredients, it's going to offer the right benefits. But one thing that is important to point out, I think, is the Latin binomial of the plant. Um, it's scientific name. Lavender is lavandula angustifolia. That's your true lavender. The reason why these kinds of things are important is because if you get lavandula spicata, which is spike lavender, it's going to be much higher in camphor. Mm -hmm. And camphor is incredibly energizing. It's a beautiful um, constituent and it's beneficial for many things, but if you're looking to relax and calm down, you don't want camphor necessarily. It's also really great for um, muscle and joint stiffness, um, but again, not quite the same effect as your true lavender is going to have. So that's one of the one of the really nice aspects of French medical aromatherapy is that, I mean, in Europe, for example, they're using these with prescription to treat illness. Um, you know, we're on a different track here in the United States in terms of aromatherapy, but we are a part of a company that is doing that with these same oils in Europe. And that's, I think that's something to point out um, because I think there is room for expansion in this country in terms of how we use aromatherapy. As I mentioned, it is a phytotherapy. So there are ways with education and safety in mind that, that, that works. One other thing I wanted to point out about scientific, and then I'll get back to the sustainability part is when we're testing an oil, the same plant, rosemary is a perfect example. Rosemary grown in different regions will come up with a higher level of either simeon or virginum. And we indicate that on our boxes because while it's coming from the same plant, and grown, um, simeon is grown in a drier, more arid climate, usually at a higher altitude. Um, the amount of sun, the amount of rain, the temperature, the soil quality, how close it is to the ocean, all of these things have uh, come into play when it comes to what the chemical profile of an essential oil is. 
And the reasons that it's important to know is, again, the same as that lavender versus spike lavender. Rosemary cineol and rosemary verbenum have slightly different applications. Now, you could easily just call both of these rosemary, right? Because they are both rosemary, but if you're using them for some of their therapeutic values, you want to know which type of rosemary you're using. Cineol, really great for circulation, stimulating. Again, we were just talking about it's cineol that's in the mental clarity that we started class with. Um, that, you know, memory, focus, those kinds of things. Circulation, definitely. Um, verbenum has a more regenerative, so regenerative aspect to it. Um, usually more often found in skin care and those types of applications. So it can be fun. I mean, it's definitely little rabbit holes, right? Each little aspect of aromatherapy you can spend days and days on just learning about different ways to use oils um, based on their chemical constituents. So all that aside, um, I'll get back to some sustainability pieces about um, pranarum and aromatherapy. So when we are, when we're talking about aromatherapy, there's an important piece to remember, which is dilution. Um, we don't need to use essential oils meat, except for a few isolated um, situations where I would say, yeah, that could be definitely the way to do it. Because there's such a concentrated product, um, responsibly dilution is important, but safety is also a key component in dilution. And when I'm talking about dilution, typically 1% dilution is appropriate for most applications, and that's nine drops in one ounce of carrier oil. So it doesn't take much to get to, get to 1%. Um, and so, so let's see, sustainability in terms of our usage versus what, how we're presenting the product, right? Um, so I got a little excited there, and then my brain did this, and I'm like, which way do I go? <laughs> um, but we have, well, let's just talk about our usage. So dilution is important both because of safety, but also responsibility. And so what I was getting at is the concentrated nature of essential oils. So as an example, um, this is a liter bottle. To fill this bottle with Rose Auto Hydrosol, or essential oil, excuse me, you would need 5.5 million roses. 5.5 million roses, just to fill this bottle. Wow. So, you know, if in your mind's eye, think of a field that contains 5.5 million roses. If you think about how much chemical would be involved if you weren't growing organically, you're then concentrating that into here. Wow. It's 40 roses per drop. So you're putting more than three dozen roses in, in, in one drop of oil. So di diluting that is pretty, pretty obvious as to why. But the thing that's also important to take note of is that when an organic plant is just left to grow in such a way, the quality and the quantity of the essential oils it's going to produce will be higher. Mm -hmm. Because the essential oil is the immune system of the plant. Mm -hmm. It's created for uh, protection against microbes, against mm -hmm. pests, against invasive species. Um, it is just, it's created by the plant for all those reasons. So therefore, when sprayed, they won't create that same amount because they don't have to do that same work. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like shooting yourself in the foot to spray because then you're not getting as much of the product as you would like. So organic growth creates more, a better quality, and obviously, then not a concentrated chemical product mm -hmm. that you're probably putting right on your body, which then goes right into your body, which I think we're all trying to avoid as much as possible. So that is uh, one aspect of sustainability that we can offer um, as the consumer, right? Is how much do I need to use and how am I going to use it? Um, another example of yield in terms of how much a plant will offer an essential oil is frankincense, and frankincense is a really important topic in terms of sustainability. It is growing in popularity right now. 
Uh, it has been for a while. It's not showing signs of slowing much. Um, we are already, we have lost at least three species of frankincense to extinction. Um, they have tried and found that propagating by our hand doesn't really work. Um, the only way that they'll propagate is on their own, which I find pretty beautiful. Um, they're resilient, strong trees. They grow out of rocks sometimes. They grow in the most desolate, isolated, crazy situations. I mean, the best, there's sort of an iconic photo of two rocks of a rock face coming together in between the roots of this frankincense tree going to either side. It's almost as if it's holding rocks together. Um, they're just, they're austere and they're gorgeous um, and they offer a really beautiful oil. I won't deny that. Frankincense is wonderful. It has so many applications. Um, however, the nature of essential oils is that a lot of oils can do a lot of the same thing. And so our responsibility is to make sure that the oil we're using, especially when it comes to frankincense, is this really the oil I need to use or is there another oil that would work here um, instead? Uh, frankincense, so let's talk about when it comes to the, the sourcing of frankincense, it's done by cutting into the frankincense tree and the tree creates sap to protect itself. We collect the sap, it dries into resin, and then we will distill that resin and then we get essential oil. Your average tree cut yields about 100 grams of resin. 100 grams of resin, if you just distilled that, would make three milliliters of essential oil. So that wouldn't even fill this bottle. Um, a mature frankincense tree can handle about three cuttings a year. Many are getting three cuttings a month. Mm. And then the life force is in that sap, protecting themselves, and then they die because they've run out of their life force. Um, so we're over tapping, which of course will kill anything. Um, sustainable harvest is about leaving something for the next yeah. harvest, right? It, it just seems like the, the statistics that you're kind of throwing out at us, it's, it seems like how in the world would you be able to even supply enough for the consumer without fully depleting the organic resources right i mean like how could you how can you do that how can you have a sustainable company right well so far we're not doing that yeah and within 40 years but i would guess far less well yeah, it'll be gone crazy. um wow so here's some interesting facts about essential oils only about 15 percent of essential oils end up in the aromatherapy business the rest are in food and cosmetics oh. Um, so we're only using a small portion and I feel like when I see the amount of frankincense that moves through our warehouse, I'm like, Ooh, I get nervous. I'm like, is that okay? Are we good? Is it down the No, but we're sourcing responsibly. Mm -hmm. we, re we source from a company called Buzz Wellness. They're out of Somaliland, which is in Somalia. Um, they take the resin because it's very shelf stable and fine to travel. We then have it's to distilled in Vermont. Um, you know, roses on the other hand, you have to pick before the dew dries and you have to distill them immediately, such that if your fields are too far from the distillery, you have to bring a mobile distillation unit wow. and distill right there on the spot. Um, it speaks to the cost of rose auto. But you know, if you're cutting over five million or whatever, right, to fill right. one bottle, right. yep. which would translate to, I don't know how many little five milliliter bottles, but not a whole lot. Right. Yeah. It, we, so it makes you wonder when you go out into the stores, and I'm not just saying for pilgrims, but you know, you go to the new store yeah. and you see all these oils. Now, I would imagine the majority of those that we're seeing out in you know, TJ Maxx and Ross, wherever else, you know, they would yeah. have them, they're probably not, certainly not the level of organic and, and um, a whole right. essential oil. There, I'm sure there, it's just garbage. I bet you the, a lot of it is... The bulk of it is synthetic. Not, yeah, yeah, that's the word I was looking yeah. for. It's got to be... Yeah, the bulk of it isn't even pure but essential But people don't oil. realize that. Oh, so no. they just go, oh, it's lavender. Okay, cool. Right. Exactly. You're going to use it. 
I know. It's sprinkling on my pillow at night. You know? Totally. Totally. You are um, 100%. I have no idea. And I, I mean, I'm not really educated on essential oils, but I have taken some other classes and stuff. I have no idea that the, the scientific components, mm -hmm. like just in rosemary and lavender that you just explained. Yeah. I had no idea that there were the two different right. types. Yeah. You know, you think you're just getting lavender or you're just getting rosemary. Well, exactly. And that's why when you find oils at like TJ Maxx, I'm not saying all of them are bad, but they can slap lavender on any version of lavender. You don't know which one it is. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Which is disconcerting. I, I, I never knew that. Yeah. It's just I mean, not responsible. Yeah. Um, and then think about the candles and yes. the bath salts and... Yes. I know. I mean, <laughs> every little the eye masks and the, you know, everything that you can buy out there that's just... Well, here's another mind-boggling stat is that um, over the years of research that I've done on oils and whatnot, frankincense, the, the Roman Catholic Church uses 50 tons of resin a year. Yeah, I, I, for a ton, just 50 tons a year. Why? Um, because of yes. antiquated tradition. Mm -hmm. um, they, since the dawn of Catholicism, they have been burning incense yes. resin mm -hmm. yeah. in their services. Now, the reason this started was because they were trying to purify the space and the air. Frankincense, myrrh, really great to help clean things up. Mm -hmm. We are now in a society where we, for the most part, have pretty good sanitation most places. Um, we are bathing with regularity. We, we know how to dispose of things properly, so we're not needing those quite as much. Um, I don't want to take away a, a practice that has been a tradition for centuries. Right. However, could we find another way to do it? I would think we could. However, um, you know... That's another topic, but it is a, a major source of frankincense use. Um, anyway, so that's frankincense. Um, that's sustainability in terms of keeping in mind what goes into this bottle. Um, really being able to think outside of the moment, which is kind of hard in this days. We've set up society so that we don't. We've set up instant gratification and we've set up instant, I, I need it, I want it, I got it. Um, and that is convenient and that's lovely for a lot of reasons, but also we need to consider what that means because if you think about 5.5 million roses in a field and you think about um, if you're spraying that field, you're thinking about the soil, you're thinking about the water in that area, you're thinking about the air, the quality of life for the people working in those fields um, before it even gets to you. I mean, I feel like we're, we've lost track of that aspect. And that's what's nice about the transparency and traceability of our products is that it allows you to sort of travel into that experience of where it came from and what it was doing before it got to you. Um, so I'm going to move on now to hide your salts. I picked it up so I wouldn't forget where I wanted to go. Rose. Um, damask rose, are you, either of you averse to me spraying this? Mm -hmm. I just want you to get a, a scent of the rose. Is that okay for you? Yeah. So I'm going to spray it over you so it sort of finally mists down to you and showers you with the magic of rose. Mm -hmm. What's this? It's divine. Mm -hmm. Jessica, you mm -hmm. want Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take a little hit myself. I love those. Ooh. So, hydrosols. This is the co-product of distillation. Um, for a long time, in fact, they would get rid of that after the distillation process. So, just briefly, distillation. We're gonna. I'm gonna make some imaginary vats with my hands. We've got one here. It's water. It's heated up. As it heats, it begins to steam. The steam travels through a tube into the next vat where the plant material has been packed in. So that when the steam pushes through that plant material, it's pulling out the essential oils. So the steam carries the essential oils into another coil, which is a condenser where cold water is introduced so that it can cool 
back into water. And then over here, in our fourth imaginary vat, we have the final product, which is the water. And then the essential oils, which are hydrophobic and get to the top, and we skim those off to put into our essential oil bottles. Um, but we have this whole vat of water product left over. It's water that's moved through plants. It has the water-soluble constituents. Um, they're more gentle. They're more um, subtle mm -hmm. in their application than the essential oils, but just as effective, in my opinion. Um, hydrosols are my, my main focus right now in terms of aromatherapy. Um, the essential oils and the hydrosols have a similar therapeutic value, um, but with this, I'm not concerned about walking around the room and spraying everyone for as long as they feel they need or I think they might want, um, because it's water-soluble constituents in this, this water-based product. Um, I would not do that with the essential oils, you know, yeah. and I'm sprinkle <laughs> those around. So this is a really great option for those who are looking for um, both ease of use without dilution, but also wanting to use part of the product that might have gone to waste once upon a time. Um, isn't as much used as essential oils, but should be, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Easily could be. There's There are so many applications. Um, one is just freshening the space around you, as I just did, um, using it as a facial mist, using it in the hair, both to aromatize or to texturize or to give it a little bit of extra oomph, if you will. I have very fine hair, so I spray hydrosols nonstop because it just builds... Up a little bit of weight and takes up some space, you know. Um, you can spray this uh, if you were so inclined and had a bottle of water. You could just take this and do that. And you've got a little rose water, right? Um, it's not quite the same as rose water, rose water, right? But you at least can think of all the different ways you can use this. One of my favorite uses for this particular style of hydrosol because we have a spray pump as well. But this is a continuous spray as you fill your bath, you do all the things you want, whether it's salts or oils or whatever, but you just finish the bath, a little spray across the top. And I promise you, it seems like nothing much, but it is one of the loveliest experiences I've had. Because it aromatizes that space above the water, it hovers right there in that steam. Um, and well, we'll talk about it when we get into diffusion, but um, it really has a physiological response for the body, not just a, oh, that's a nice mm -hmm. smell, you know? But hydrosols are really great also when, it's, when we're using them for a facialness, we're using them because they can work as a toner, as a skin prep. Some are very astringent, um, but they really help whatever you're gonna put on the skin next be more absorbed into your skin. Wow. Um, so this is a great time to talk about skincare. Uh, we have a skincare line, and one of the main components of it is um, the facial mists. And the facial mist is something that will really, um, as I said, it'll prep the skin, it'll help the skin be absorbent of whatever you're putting on it. But our skin is made up of, or there's a protective barrier on the skin. It's made of oil and water. Naturally sourced, that's our sweat and our sebum. Um, the protective barrier helps the pH. It protects your skin from microbes, protects it from excessive um, like pigmentation, um, lack of radiance, uh, protects you from massive breakouts, things like that. The pH is keeping the skin in balance. Aromatherapy is all about bringing balance back to the body. So it starts with a, an oil cleanser. Um, I'm going to step one step back and talk about oil cleanser. Oil cleansing is one of the best ways to clean your face thoroughly without stripping that natural protective barrier. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to make sure that we're doing the right balance of oil and water if we're not cleansing in a way that supports that same skin. Of course, if you use soap, doesn't mean you're lost forever. You can still bring back the balance to the skin, but it's a lot easier if you're not stripping it in the first place. So when you use an oil cleanser, and I have samples up here, so if, if you're interested at the end, you can come up and grab some samples and try some different things. But the, the oil cleanser really 
a thorough cleanse because it's like treating wet. It's going in there to break up any makeup, dirt, or debris that's maybe mixed with sebum and clogs. I should quickly show you. So then you can feel the difference in the skin between sides. Notice the appearance of the skin between the sides. So the first one was the cleanser? Sorry, the first one was the facial mist. I didn't do the, the mist. cleanser because okay, yeah, I don't have the one then, on there. And then you're, then you're putting the oil. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you start with the cleanser. Wow, sparkle. Uh, well, yeah. Look at the difference. That's crazy. I know, isn't that amazing? Um, and so wow. I will say this, that the one of the beautiful aspects of oil cleansing is that there is a massaging going on, right? You're massaging it into the skin, and that is really beneficial for the skin. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a mix of your own hands mm -hmm. doing the work mm -hmm. along with the products that you've used. So it's a nice way to employ sustainability in your day to day because it is very rare to find a complete line of skincare that is 100% certified organic. Um, as I mentioned, so the facial mist is made up of hydrosols and then aloe vera. Aloe vera is a natural humectant, which brings a little extra moisture to the surface of the skin. The, um, I'm going to read the ingredients. So I can see it says glow. So there must be, because there's a little shimmer to it. Yep, but there must be a... Uh, it's just it's just the essential oils and the oil. Yeah. Hmm. Take a look at it in two hours too. Will it still shimmer? It'll still look really good. Yeah. But I mean, it almost looks like there's got to be some sort of. So we didn't put mica though. That would have been a cool idea. Mm -hmm. I love it. Because I know other companies have done that with um, mm -hmm. their facial oils, where they have actual mica in it. It does have radiance, but this is just. Oils in your and your skin. Um, it's amazing what a little bit of oil can do. And I think in skincare we've always been pretty scared to put oils on our skins, mm -hmm. um, especially like I remember as a kid, you know, teenagers breaking out like take oils, benzoyl peroxide and oxyclean yes. and all these crazy things that just strip the skin. So um, I just wanted to point out that this is simple in its steps, right? You cleanse, you prep, and then you treat the skin. Um, the ingredients are so clean that there's no concern about, well, what am I putting on my skin, mm -hmm. which then ends up in my body, or using um, virgin plant oils, which are our carrier oils, um, and a little bit of essential oil for the facial cleanser. And just to reiterate, it is formulated to rinse off with water. You don't have to do a washcloth with it, so you don't have to add that step. I just think it's a nice, pretty easy way to give a little pampering to the skin when we oftentimes neglect it. Um, then the facial mist is made with hydrosols, the aloe, um, so a nice combination there, but very simple and clean products. And then the moisture treatment oil, again, virgin plant oils, essential oils, that's it. What's, what are the plants? What are the essential yep. oils? Yep, so this one, um, well, there's some frankincense in here, um, small amount. There's some cystis, which is rock rose sometimes called. Mm -hmm. This is a really, really beneficial oil for um, skin, for regeneration of the skin, um, for supporting the skin's ability to do that. Um, it's, it's in our rose regenerative facial oil as well, which is a very, um, it's like a fan favorite, if you will, in the skincare. It works really well with this. It just adds an, a little bit of extra punch to this. So I know a lot of people who like to use both. Um, it also has vetiver. So that's that resinous deeper note that you're sensing in there. Um, vetiver, vetiver comes from the roots of a grass that typically grows along riverbanks. It's something to help prevent erosion. Um, so while it's grounding for soil, literally, it is also then grounding for us. Oftentimes what an oil is sourced from and what it does in nature is often what it will do for us. Um, the combination of these oils I find so divine that I sometimes will put a few drops in my bath. I'm <laughs> using this because it smells so good. Um, and it's just like a bath oil where you're using virgin plant oils, you're using essential oils. Um, so there's argan in here, rose hip. Argan oil um, 
you know, I call it liquid gold. It's one of the best for skincare. I found out recently that um, my boss lived in Morocco for about 15 years when he was growing up. And not only do the people there where Argan comes from use it all over their body, they also use it internally. And I had no idea. Um, and so they're really treating from the inside out. So it speaks to the level of luster and beauty that their skin just seems to inherently have. Um, I was like, I'm just going to start chugging our <laughs> That sounds great. Um, so you have a wear Right, right. It's so funny. Um, so then pomegranate seed, that's not something that we offer individually. So when it comes to the skincare line and some of our other um, pre-made formulas, you oftentimes get the benefit of new ingredients that we don't offer as um, an individual product. So pomegranate is one of those. And um, I feel like I picked this up because I wanted to make sure I remember correctly. I don't have my glasses on. That was camellia oil in this. Oh yeah, it's the first one. I just skipped right over. So camellia oil, again, another one that we don't offer on its own. But this is a really great oil to support the skin's regenerative um, luster, its beauty. I mean, everything in this product is designed to make the skin glow. Now, we don't just have Glow, we also have a line called Clear. There's some samples of the treatment oil up here, um, if you were interested. Um, while this product is created to help keep the skin clear or to clear any breakouts, it has a really lovely scent profile. Mm. And there's nothing in here, while well, there's white willow bark to help, the white willow bark is a natural source of salicylic acid. Um, while that's in it, Putting that on your skin without pimples is not going to damage your skin. So mm -hmm. it's something, that's why I brought samples of this one too, because it smells so good. Mm -hmm. um, and I find, at least in my experience, you know, when I've been looking for things to help with skin breakouts, oftentimes I think scent is left out of the equation because they're focusing so hard on treatment of the situation. Sure. Yeah. This is such a great way to pamper skin that needs that extra help. Mm -hmm. um, had I had this as a teenager and then in my 20s when my skin blew up again, um, I would have felt like, oh, I'm on puzzle. Right, yeah. I mean, I'm still breaking up. Yeah. Now. yeah. It's like, what the heck is going on? Right. I don't get it. it yeah. Never, Who could ever understand? Yeah. I feel like I never thought I'd have pimples in my 50s. <laughs> I know. I mean, I feel like you start getting wrinkles, then pimples should be off the board. Like, yeah. nope, that's not happening anymore. <laughs> nope. I don't think you get slammed with it again. Yeah. yeah. So the clear is a really nice option there. Okay. There's also, so it's a facial mist and treatment oil there as well. Okay. And that facial mist is um, primarily peppermint and frankincense hydrosols, um, both which are really great. So there's a way to use frankincense um, without using the oil to use the um, hydrosol. Of course. So that line you don't think would be too, would, I mean, I get it, it's oils, mm -hmm. but you don't think that it would be drying? No. 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 I mean, I want to stay away from anything that's going to suck the moisture. I have the driest skin known to the planet, I think. Yeah. And especially here. And I was here because yeah. it's so dry and cold now for winter. Yeah, well, I'm from Minneapolis. We get colder. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think dry. Yes. yes. Probably. Um, yes. So the clear does not do that to me. No. That's what I think is so wonderful because. Again, it's that misconception that oil is bad for oily skin, or oil is bad for mm -hmm. breakout prone mm -hmm. skin, and that is not true. And in mm -hmm. fact, sometimes stripping mm -hmm. that protective barrier, which is an oil, from the skin will cause more breakouts. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, we just got it wrong at one point, and we're having a hard time getting out of that and moving into mm -hmm. something new. Um, mm -hmm. But I promise once you try it, um, you'll see how lovely it can be. There's a third line of the skincare called Calm, and that's for sensitive skin, um, irritation prone skin. I really like it too for skin that maybe has had too much time in the sun, too much time in the cold, too much time in the wind, um, where the skin can get rutted or chafed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. The Calm is a really nice mm -hmm. combination. The facial mist has lavender and rhum and chamomile hydrosols. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the same essential oils in the treatment oil. But again, it's, a, it's, it's such a beautiful way. I mean, the whole point of this talk is sustainability, but sometimes I feel like I just keep hitting it over the head. But 
sustainability can be brought into our practice in so many different ways. Um, and this is one where you know, you know you're getting a good product because it's 100% certified organic. It's very simple ingredients and you can pronounce everything. Mm -hmm. um, except for like the Latin name, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's just, a, it's, I just, I'll stop there and move on. So I wanted to talk about diffusion for sure because diffusion can be a really nice way to use essential oils but keep sustainability in mind. And that's because you don't have to use much of it. Um, when you're using a diffuser, this is a, we'll see if it'll work, it's been having, um, I think it needs to be charged, I think it got sad. I traveled, I flew today with this in my pocket, which I wouldn't recommend for a portable diffuser. <laughs> um, however, I like using them on the plane, but when you slide this down and the battery's charged because it's a rechargeable, um, oh, look, it's nice. trying to, it's like, I'm here, don't forget about me. Um, it just it gives off this really subtle mist, but it stays very close to you, so it's a mm. personal portable That's nice. diffuser. Oh, and I brought it because I wanted to show you how you can use it as like a little facial mist mm. um, as a part of your skincare routine, but sadly... Um, Is that part of the company as well? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Actually, I wonder if I have another one. Well, if I'll look for it before we leave tonight um, to, to try again. Um, but so diffusion, I thought of it because if it's a diffuser, diffusion is a reservoir of water in which you put some essential oils and then it fills the room, right? So five to ten drops is all you really need. Um, at least to start, some oils, maybe lavender sometimes, can use a, you can use a little bit more and it's not too overwhelming and overpowering, but a little goes a long way again. Mm -hmm. um, but diffusion is an important um, vessel because you're then taking it into the body in two different ways. You're taking it in through respiration, um, through the lungs, the essential oil, the tiny little particles are actually entering the body, but also through your olfaction system. So your sense of smell is doing more than just allowing you to say, oh, I'm smelling lavender, I'm smelling rose. Um, it's, it's sending messages to your brain. It's doing that through these olfactory nerves that come down through you into your nasal cavity. They take the messages of the molecules, the particles into the um, olfactory bulb and then into the olfactory tract, which leads right to the limbic system, to the hippocampus, to the hypothalamus. This is all part of the brain that's regulating your autonomic nervous system, your hormones, your emotions, uh, your memories, all of these things, and eliciting a physiological response in the body. Uh, you know, your autonomic nervous system is the part of your body that's helping you um, either go to fight or flight when you're feeling threatened or nervous, or down to rest and digest when there isn't a threat or stress to deal with. Um, and so if, you're, if that's off balance, um, the essential oils are a great way to help bring some balance back to that autonomic nervous system, mm -hmm. um, just because you're breathing it in. And we've already done it a bunch tonight, so we've already treated ourselves in a beautiful way. Um, oh, I brought these. Here, I'm going to give you some of these dried lavender while we're talking just for a little bit of lavender. You're welcome. So, I wanted, this was, I was going to talk about this earlier, but um, when I got excited about roses, but when we were talking about lavender and the distillation of lavender, it takes enough of this material to equal the weight of an African elephant which is 12,000 pounds of the biggest elephants to make six gallons of essential oil. Wow. That's so, amazing. And that's so lightweight, right? And so that was sort of why, you know, having it in hand allows you to sort of get a tactile experience of, oh my God, how much could I hold it all? Where I, you know. So anyway, back to diffusion. But the diffusion, um, if, you, if you just even take a couple of those little things. Right. It's like, isn't that crazy? Cool? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other thing too about um, the distillation is that there, it, 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 it is done before the flowers fully open. Um, so you, with lavender, as I said, roses, they are picked before the dew dries. With lavender, you want the dew to be dry, but you also want to pick them before noon. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? So depending on the day. Okay, so now I have some lavender at my house that I grow, and it, I don't know what kind it is. 
this. Yeah. But it does, it's like a perennial, it does come back. Great. Yeah. Typically. Yep. Um, but I've never been able to like, you know, clip it and dry it and have it be like this. Now, if it's the fresh live plant growing out there in the soil and I pick a piece of it and I have mess with it and smell my fingers, then yeah, it smells lovely in that moment, but it, it just goes away. Yeah. Very quick. So I mean, maybe it's just a, I don't know what kind of lavender it was. It's just, you know, from sure. nurseries. Well, I think. I'm sure there's so many different varieties too. There are, especially when you're buying from a garden store. I mean, I have a little one near my house and they usually have eight different styles of lavender. Yeah, like there's English lavender, there's all Munstead, this. Lavender. right. And so I'm always asking them, like, what's the Latin binomial? So I know if this corresponds, is this a Augustifolia? Mm-hmm. Typically, it's not. Typically, they're hybrids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the hybrids are done so because the last longer. Concentration. Not always, but sometimes. It depends. But I would say that, um, you know, they use fresh flour for the oil. And this is dry. Right. When you're doing that, when you're experiencing the plant in in its element, I think that in fact is probably the most profound experience of the essential oils you can get. Because when you smell a flower, you're smelling its oils. Because while it's also the immune system, it's also what the plant excretes to attract pollinators. Mm-hmm. So I mean that's why we use it. When, you know, I mean, perfuming was to attract a suitor or something like that. Um, we use it in the same way. So, yeah, I mean, I think definitely there are certain styles that will lend themselves to a longer finish, if you will, in a dry flower. It's funny, too, because I grow lavender. Um, I brought a big pot of it in this year to see if I could winter it over. Inside? Inside, oh, yeah. Wow. And because ours don't come back, we, it's yeah. really rare for lavender to come back in Minnesota. And I find even just running my fingers through the leaves of the plant is enough. I don't even need the flowers, even though the bulk of the oil is in the flower. Yeah. Um, it's still, it's still a really aromatic experience yes. that can. We did that one one year with with the rosemary plant. That did it work? Well, it, you know, I. Kept it alive over winter and it yeah. didn't look real great. <laughs> yeah. Even tried throwing it back out in the garden the next year and it was like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, rosemary's tough. I've heard. Mm-hmm. I've been trying. It's to... tough here. Yeah. They, it just. It's a Mediterranean plant. So. I went to the south of France once and was blown away by the size of the rosemary. Mm-hmm. I used to have bushes this big in yeah. California. Yeah, I mean, I it's saw like a like tree, this, probably like this room. I mean, it was yeah. just massive. Mm-hmm. And all my friends thought I was a complete nutso because I was just standing there, like, taking it all in. You know, like, this is incredible, leaning up into it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> I took it for granted, and then I moved here and tried to grow rosemary. To yeah, true. Right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right. It's definitely challenging. <laughs> well, so we're coming up on the end of our hour. Um, I wanted to just quickly touch on some of the mini cap options. Um, you know, while in Europe they're using it extensively internally, we are not on that on that path yet here, but we do have some options for internal use. And this allows for safe, um, you know, it's regulated in terms of at least telling you how to use it. Of course, that responsibility falls on the consumer, but it's a single drop of essential oil in each mini cap. Oh. It's diluted in the virgin plant oil. So you have that um, delivery system so that it gets all the way down into the system where it needs to get. Because when you're sprinkling essential oils in your water, mm-hmm. um, you know, they act as a, as a gas, they're volatile. They just want to absorb into the first tissue they come into contact with. And so getting a lot of essential oils in the tissues of your mouth or esophageal tract is not great for the fryer. Um, so when you want to consume an essential oil, best to do so um, with a good delivery system. Um, if you want to flavor your water, I highly recommend just going straight to the lemon or um, using peppermint tea to flavor water rather than the essential oil. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm not opposed to internal use, but I just think if you're going to use it, um, use it in the best way in terms of responsibility for sustainability, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Are there any questions? What are some them? of the, the ones that are yep. used for internally? So we have oregano, lavender, and ginger here, and you're welcome to try one if you want before you leave. Uh, we also offer lemon, lemon grass. We have peppermint, and we have one other one. Would you, you would, you would take those individually and not all together, right? I wouldn't take them all together. However, uh, I chose to, I traveled in India and Bali for a month and I didn't, I, I chose to use oregano and Ravensara as my protection, um, both for dysentery and all kinds of things. Um, and it worked really well for me. I mean, I was also careful about what I ate and my exposure to other things. However, um, I didn't have, you know, sometimes they recommend certain shots to take when you go traveling. Um, and I thought, well, okay, I'm, I think I'm pretty strong immunity-wise, but I'm gonna take these things to help me. Um, so there are times where using them in concert is a good idea. And then other times where it's just not needed. Yeah. But lemon is so great um, as a cleansing. Mm -hmm. agent, if you will, whether it's literally surface cleaning or mm -hmm. in the body. Um, it can really help um, the liver do its job. Um, it supports the liver in that way. Um, but I think lemongrass is a really nice one just because it's so fresh and somewhat unexpected. Um, of course, it's used in flavoring for food, so it's not the first time for someone to put it inside their body. But, um, it has, you know, abilities to help support digestion, um, and there's some nice studies around lemongrass in terms of uh, certain viruses, like H1N1, which I can give you the resource on. Um, if you go to Google Scholar and enter any essential oil, um, and it'll bring you a bunch of results of tests where they've used essential oils for various things. Wow. Um, and then whether or not they've had success, you'll have to read, but um, what's that? Google Play. Scholar. Scholar. Yeah, it's like a whole different search engine that will keep all the riffraff out, you know, and just give you abstracts of what's been studied, which mm -hmm. is nice because if you just Google lemongrass on regular Google, mm -hmm. you'll get everything. You'll get it all. Mm -hmm. And then it gets wow. overwhelming. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah, use it. What are some of the medicinal reasons for using essential oils? Well, your immunity, your immune health is a big one. Uh, because that's the primary use of the oil for the plant itself, which is, well, literally all of them. Some are better for um, helping to support the body against virus, some better for bacteria, some for fungus. Um, well, how are you supposed to know? Google Scala? Well, no, I mean, further classes, right? Yeah. Um, speaking to the people here at Pilgrims, they are very knowledgeable. Um, whether it's essential oils or anything else, they can always help you find the right thing. Um, we have a beautiful product called Good Samaritan, and that's a combination of essential oils that's really good at help supporting the immune system and protecting you. So that would be my first one if, you're, if, you're, if your concern is your immune health. What's it called? Good Samaritan. Yeah. Have you is heard that a, 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 just an oil? Or it's a blend. A blend of, of, of uh, essential oils. Straight. Caterina. Capsule. No, it's just essential oil and um, in a diffuser primarily. Yeah, or a larger one would probably be better for Good Samaritan because you probably want to fill the space. It's a nice thing to diffuse if you're having a gathering. Um, I diffuse it at my house when either I'm sick or my daughter's sick and I don't want the other one to get sick. Right, or if there's something going around, it's a definite protection um, for all of those things. Other than diffusing it, another way to use Good Samaritan, you don't want to use it directly on the skin unless it's diluted, but it's, again, that palm inhalation that we were doing with mental clarity. You can do that with Good Samaritan. And then after you've done your breathing, you can wipe it down on your scarf. You could take it into the hair on your face. Do you have to dilute it before you do the palm? Or? No, the palm is really going to do like one drop or right. two drops in it. But if you want to put it on your body, you, you can do. either buy a pre-diluted roll-on, which we have, or dilute it yourself. And what, you, what do you find is the best? I know that there's different oils you can dilute with, like, I guess there's all. What's, what do you think is the best, one of the better ones to um, dilute essential oils? 
It depends on the usage. So virgin plant oils, the carrier oils, they all have medicinal value as well. So it's like another level of, of medicinal value. However, if you're just looking for something, um, I really like um, jojoba. I really like apricot. Um, and we sell all those carrier oils here. Yep. Yep. I mean, what about like just coconut, or is that because it's too fragrant itself that maybe? Coconut, we don't sell coconut here. Uh, they have a version of it in, in Europe, but it's, um, it does not travel well. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in the way that we have it. Um, okay. So they haven't introduced it here. We do use fractionated coconut oil in some of our roll-ons. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Of, is because that's what I've heard before. Fractionated yeah. Coconut. Fractionated coconut oil is great. So if you have that or okay. can get that, that's another option as well. Um, you buy an E oil or an almond oil maybe. Almond is great. Almond is a great source of E as well. I love almond oil for under eye. Um, it's really good for circulation and, and the skin health there. Um, um, how often do you use it? Uh, depends on the oils. I mean, I use an essen some essential oil every single day. Oh. Yeah. Like Good Samaritan, how often? That's as a, an automated basis. So yeah. if someone around us is sick, I'll use it. If there's something going on in my daughter's school, we're diffusing it more. I see. Um, Good Samaritan is one that you wouldn't necessarily need to use without reason, right? Okay. But another reason for essential oil usage would just be your general health and wellness, like keeping yourself in balance, whether that's for stress, anxiety, and that's what I was talking about in terms of how it affects the brain when the scent molecules come in. But you had mentioned earlier about respiratory issues. Yeah. So we were talking about the pine, um, black spruce, all of the evergreens, um, have a really good affinity for the respiratory system. And so those are the ones I would suggest. In addition to that, rosemary and peppermint that are in the mental clarity are both helpful in that way as well. Okay. Yeah, so you've got um, a lot of options because there's black spruce, there's balsam fir, there's scotch pine. And the, the people at Pilgrims can help you, right? Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do you guys have this whole line? Yeah, yes. pretty much. The hydrosols we don't have yet, but we'll get those in. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have the old ones. Oh, we have the old ones. But not the new packaging. No, that's right. Well, okay. those have the, you have the old pump sprays. The old yeah, pump right. sprays. pump sprays are, and, and you're not losing out on anything. It's the same product, just a different delivery system. Sure. So it's a pump spray, whereas right. these, not aerosol, so they're, they're compressed air. Uh -huh. You need to spray them in which way you want. I love that. Yeah, it's fun. Mm -hmm.